I am sorry for that. That is a terrible start to this whole morning. <clears throat> well, it would have been a, a pretty cool night as Peter would have been sitting by the fire, warming his hands, probably thinking a whole bunch of things. As he was watching this man who he thought was going to be the king, who was going to set his rule and reign over Israel. And things had started off so well. You know, this Jesus who he had been following so closely had been doing all of these miracles, had been responding to all of his critics so wisely and perceptively. And yet in the last few hours, this man had been captured by someone who he thought was a friend. A man who was close to the inner circle. And he had tried to stand up for Jesus, but Jesus had told him to put his sword away. And sitting there around the fire, he was confused. Wondering, how did it all get to this point? And someone came up to him and said, you must have been with this Jesus man. And, and he said, no, I, I don't know him. And he kept thinking, what, are, what does it all mean? You know, what, what did Jesus mean when he said, Satan is asked to sift you, and I've asked that your faith wouldn't fail, but that when you had repented, you would strengthen the brothers. Wasn't Jesus supposed to be the one who was going to be strengthening the brothers? Wasn't he going to be the king? What did this mean? And again, someone tells Jesus or tells Peter, weren't you with Jesus? Peter again denies him. And in these denials, all of a sudden, the rooster crows and Peter realizes, ah, that's what it meant. That's what Jesus meant when he told him he was going to be sifted. Peter, heartbroken, left not knowing what to do. As I think about that story, I wonder how much of that was in, in Peter's mind as he was read, writing 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles um, or your smartphones or anything else that has a Bible on it, uh, you could turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 6 to 11, and we're going to start in verse 8, a little unorthodox, and then we're going to work our way back to the beginning. But I wonder if, if Peter was thinking about that time as he wrote these words. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Who would know something like that better than Peter? I mean, Peter was, was called Satan by Jesus, right? Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. Um, Peter is told he's going to be sifted. Peter is told he's going to deny Jesus. Who would know better about this enemy, this adversary, than Peter himself. He knows that the adversary is, is like a lion seeking someone to devour. And this idea of being watchful, as Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane, was it not Jesus who said, watch and pray with me? And Peter and, and the other two fall asleep, and Jesus comes and says, couldn't you pray with me one hour? Be watchful. Be watchful and pray. So point, point number one here is that clearly there is an adversary. We have a very real adversary as the church. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us as individuals, but he wants to destroy us as a people. And I think throughout 1 Peter 5, there's a couple key things that the enemy will do to us in order to just kind of keep us off balance. He's got a couple techniques, and we're going to look at those this morning. But number one, I, I think the number one technique, he would like to try and convince us that he's not real. Right? Like, there isn't actually an enemy. There might not actually be a God. This is kind of all that there is. This natural world is it. This is what you got. And the idea of being sober-minded is not about, like, don't drink too much alcohol. 
The idea of sober-mindedness here is to be thinking clearly, to not be distracted by all these philosophies and vain theologies and all these other things that come in, but to be sober-minded. Think clearly about stuff. As Christians, we are to be thinking people, not tossed to and fro, not led this way by one emotion and this way by another emotion, but we are to be thinking clearly about the things coming at us. But we get caught up in all these things that sound so good, like my favorite one being, there is no such thing as truth. That's a great little statement, except within the statement itself, it contradicts itself. Right? If someone tells you there is no truth, all you're going to say to the person is, is that statement true? Because if that's a true statement, then there's at least one truth, and it would be that. And, and we, we hear all of these different things coming at us all the time, and they, they sound so nice. And if we're not sober-minded, if we're not watchful, we'll get caught up in these ideas, and we'll be led kind of astray from what's actually true. Verse 9 says, resist him, firm in your faith. And we're going to come back to the last half of that verse. But resist him, firm in your faith, means that we can actually resist him. Right? The, the enemy, our adversary, the devil, isn't someone who can just overpower us. Right? John in the Gospels talks about how God has told Jesus that everyone whom I give you cannot be snatched from your hands. So Satan can't just come in here and start plucking people out of the hands of God and saying, well, you're not going to be in the kingdom and you're not going to be in the kingdom. He doesn't have that kind of power and authority. Actually, it, it seems like he's on some kind of a leash. We look at the story of Job and we find out that in order for Satan to even come against Job in any way, God has to grant him some sort of permission in order to do that. When Satan wants to sift, sift Peter here, we see that he needs to come and he needs to get permission. He's an enemy that is on a leash. He doesn't have the power to come in and just destroy. He is our adversary, but he can't pluck us out of the hand of God, and so what he's going to do is he's just going to keep us off balance. And if we're not watchful, we're not careful, all he's going to get us to do is become complacent. You see, Working in the North End, I see a lot of things going on in people's lives. You know, lots of people addicted to all sorts of substances. But Satan doesn't need to do that just to keep people distracted and off balance. He just needs to keep us from loving Jesus. He just needs us to not be passionate about this king who is coming back. He just needs us to not worry about the man who has forgiven us our sins. He just needs to keep us from an abundance of life. As long as he can keep us off balance, then he's doing just fine. Because he might not be able to pluck us out of God's hands, but if we're complacent, at least no one else is going to be in God's hands. And so if he just keeps people from meeting Jesus, well, that's fine with him too. Because we are not Satan's number one enemy. Satan hates Jesus much more than he hates us. And Jesus actually gives us some really good ways that we overcome temptation. And it's all about knowing who God is. It's all about knowing who we really are. Right? And Jesus looks to Scripture and he counters the enemy the adversary, by knowing his Bible, which was not really a thing back then, but for us it's now a thing. We got the Bible. So we're going to know our Bibles. That's the way that we're going to do it, right? And if, if he can just keep us to the point where we actually don't open up our Bibles, you know, where we just go, well, reading the Bible is like not something I have to do, right? Because we're not legalistic anymore. That was like back then. Now we're super grace-filled people. We don't necessarily need to do much of anything, um, in order to be saved. So, like, I don't have to read my Bible anymore, so I don't actually, why, why would I do that every day? Well, the reason why is, is because you have an adversary. Reading the Bible doesn't benefit Jesus. It's not like Jesus benefits from you reading the Bible every day. We benefit from reading the Bible every day. We benefit by knowing what is true, so we can discern what is false. 
And so one of the attacks, and I think Satan uses this on Jesus, is pride. So we're going to go up to verse 6, and now we're going to kind of go through these. Verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. You know, the enemy would love it if he could just get us to think we are the main character of this story. But I'm just going to be bold here and say that, that you and I are not the main character. Jesus is the main character of the Bible. Right? Like, I'm not reading the Bible to try and find myself in it. I'm trying to read the Bible to find Jesus in it. And true humility, is, it's often said, and, and I, I kind of like it, and I agree with it, is not about thinking less of yourself, but to think about yourself less. Right? Like, true humility is just when we're not actually thinking about ourselves, period. When Christ and others become b- before us. And so, false humility looks something like, and uh, my good friend Matt Clausen likes to think that I'm super, like, struggle with false humility because I'm always like, woe is me. And he's probably right, because uh, I'm actually quite a proud person. But uh, it's not humble to say, oh, I'm such a rotten sinner. Oh, I'm a terrible person. I can't believe I did that again. Why do I keep doing that same sin? Like, I can't believe I did that again. I just said I wasn't ever going to do it. Now I'm doing it again. Common word in that whole sentence is the word I. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I'm doing it again. I can't, I, 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 I. So true humility isn't about going like, oh, I'm a really bad person. Oh, look how bad of a sinner I am. Nobody's surprised that you're sinning except you. Right, like, Like, when I sin, it's not like someone's like, oh, he sinned? Oh, my, I can't believe it. He's supposed to be so holy, especially now that he's a pastor and they never sin. Right, Jason? Yeah, you've never sinned once since being a pastor. So, like, and people, like, that's not true. Nobody's surprised. We all know that we're going to sin. I don't know why when we sin we get so, so shocked about it. Does that mean we don't take it seriously and repent? For sure we do that. But we remember who it's actually about. When I sin, I sin against Jesus. When I sin, it's Jesus who forgives me. When I sin, I remember that it was Jesus who in the midst of my sinning died for me. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So what the enemy is going to do, what he wants to do, is he just wants to keep our eyes on ourself. As long as we're thinking about our own needs our own problems, our own worries, then he's doing pretty good. Because then we're not going to be thinking about the goodness of God, the glory of God, the magnitude of God, and the one who all of this is about in the first place. We were created to enjoy God, to enjoy this creation, to enjoy this creation to the glory of God. But when we come in and and we try and make ourselves God, well, the verse just before this talks about how God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But when we think we're the main character, the struggles in our lives aren't going to go away. The, The attack of the enemy there is to keep your eyes on you. The promise here, though, is that if you humble yourself, if I humble myself at the proper time, God is going to exalt me. See, when I don't humble myself, I try to fix the problem on my own. When I don't humble myself, I try to exalt myself in the midst of stuff rather than humbling myself. Rather than getting on my face and admitting I actually can't do it. You know, when we talk about recovery, um, specifically celebrate recovery in the north end and we're going through it the only way people are going to get out of the funks in life the only way they're going to overcome the sin in their life the only way that they're going to beat the addictions in their life is for them to get to the place where they say i can't do this i actually have a problem i can't do it i'm not good enough 
to get over this myself. I need someone, and that someone is Jesus. Jesus is a much, much better person to rely on in the midst of struggles than ourselves. I don't know about you, but I let myself down all the time. If I were to rely on myself just a little bit more, I don't think I'd be very far at all, actually. Because relying on myself is going to lead me nowhere. To rely on my own strength, to try and exalt myself, is only going to lead to my own destruction and futility. And I will seek for the God substitute in everything else, rather than just saying, I can't do it. But how hard is that for us? Because we want to be in control. Verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And this, this kind of ties in with the exalting yourself. Right, casting your anxieties onto God means that you have to say, I actually can't do this on my own. Like these anxieties are too much for me to carry. I have to be willing to let them go. I have to be willing to trust someone other than me. And I would just like to challenge you, like if you haven't overcome yet, why do you keep trusting in yourself that you're going to get it? Right, so we need to trust not in ourself, in our own wisdom and strength, but we trust in what Jesus has already accomplished on the cross. On the cross, Jesus bore all of our sin and all of our punishment. And so he can easily handle our anxieties. Right? What is huge for us in the moment isn't so big for the God who took on the sins of all those who are going to come to know him. Right? Like this one extra little thing here isn't going to be too much for him. Lie number two that the enemy wants to tell you. So lie number one is that the world is all about you. Lie number two, God doesn't care for, about you. You know, we come to church and we often hear that, yeah, yeah, Jesus loves us, and that's true and that's good, but he also deeply cares for us. And for me, when I think about the word care, I think about parents and kids. Good parents, which all of you are for sure, I'm sure of it, um, would want to take their kids' anxieties and struggles on themselves. Right, like, and, and parents probably don't, I wouldn't know because I'm not a parent, but I have some. Um, like, thinking about the future, having kids, I think if I could, I would want to keep them from every bad thing possible. I would want to take every hurt, every anxiety that they have. Now, we know that's not going to be best in this actual world we live in, but that's what I would want to do. You know, an earthly father will do so much for their child to keep them free. Who would, who would want to take on the burden of their kid? I mean, when, when parents watch their kids fall, you see these parents in anguish, like wishing they could have stopped it. Wishing they could just take the pain of their crying child away. And yet they can't. Because we hear in the Gospels that although... Good parents love their kids and give good gifts. Parents are still sinful and broken and, and they aren't the Savior. The only Savior that we have is Jesus. And we hear, hear here that He actually cares for us. He cares enough about our anxieties and our brokenness that He's willing to hang on a cross. He cares enough about our anxieties and our brokenness that He's willing to leave perfection to live amongst us. He cares enough about us that he's willing to give us a book that tells us who he is and it tells us how we can remove our anxieties. And it's about turning our trust from ourselves and in this world to Jesus. It's about doing it daily. It's not the one-time thing where we trust in him, but it's a daily trust where we say, I'm going to trust you in the midst of these struggles, and you can take my anxieties and my burdens. Then it says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. 
knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Third lie is you are all alone. You are the only one who is dealing with your sin and your suffering. I'm going to break it to you like uh, my pastor, Pastor Aubrey, broke it to me. He likes to tell me on a daily basis almost these words. You are not that special. To which I go, I disagree. My parents have always told me I am special. I am the most special. I am more special than all my other siblings. And uh, that's how I heard it. But, you, but you're not. Right? Like, you're not that special. If you just start talking about your suffering for, like, five minutes, you're going to find out that you are not the only one who has ever gone through what you are going through. But in the midst of suffering and pain and anxieties, what happens? We think we're the only one going through it. We think in the midst of it, it's the worst thing ever. And and I'm not trying to diminish suffering. This passage for me is super vital because it is the thing that helped me to break free from probably the worst time of my life. Two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, I went through a time in my life that I didn't even know like it was possible. I was always that guy who would have told someone going through anxiety and depression to just get over it. Right? Like, just stop being anxious. Like, just stop it. Like, you're anxious? Now stop being anxious. And uh, little did I know it's not that easy. Um, that was in my pride, you know, like that first part about humbling yourself. Um, I actually got to a point where I was terrified to leave my bedroom. I would, I would live in this house, and there was four other guys, and they would often have a number of people over. I would sit in my bedroom and shake, waiting for people to leave because I was just so anxious. Interestingly enough, the, the moment that that anxiety hit me, I can remember it so clearly because it was in an evening. I had just gone for a run, the only time I've ever run in my life. And uh, I went and I, I went to lay down, and this verse came to me. Satan has asked to sift you, but I have prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. And when you repent, you would strengthen the brothers. And in that moment, as soon as that verse came to me, my whole body started to shake, and I was filled with fear. And for four months, I struggled with this anxiety and depression to the point where I actually thought, I actually don't want to be alive anymore. Like, if this is how the rest of my life is going to be, I, I don't want to be here because the idea of being around people, and if you work with people and you start not wanting to be around people, that's a huge problem. And uh, I just didn't want to be around people anymore. And it was these verses that the Spirit of God led me to and that I just meditated on. And in the moments where I became anxious and worried, I would go through these things. And I would go, it's not about me. God cares for me so I can give him these things. Satan would want to destroy me and keep me distracted. He would want me to think that I'm alone. And that was the number one lie that the enemy fed me in that moment. That you are the only one who's thinking the way that you are thinking. But I worked with teenagers, so it couldn't possibly be true. Because there is a lot of teenagers in our culture who struggle with severe anxiety and depression. In fact, I did a sermon series on it following this, and pretty much every single youth could relate. And as I began to talk about my anxiety and my depression with people, and I began to share, it began to lose its hold and its power on me. As long as I tried to do it myself, control my own life, work through it on my own, I didn't bring other people into it, and I believed the lie that I was the only one who was thinking the types of thoughts that I had. It had complete power over me. And as soon as I began to share it, I realized, oh, I actually am not that special. And everyone I talked to for a month after that, I just began to share. I would open up meetings with other youth pastors at the time, and I would just start sharing the story. And they would begin sharing all of the stuff that they were going through. And it allowed me to actually be a huge benefit to them. Because your brothers around the world are going through the same kinds of things you are. 
And in an age where we have news and social media and everything, it's quite clear to see that the whole world is going through sufferings. Right? We are not the only ones. And, and I would like you just to join me for a moment. If you could, take your hand and just put it right in front of your eyes. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to do anything weird while you're doing it. If you could just, what do you see when your hand is there? All you see probably is, is nothing or your hand. Now I just want you to slowly bring it back. Just bring it back away from your face. What happens to your hand in the midst of that? It becomes smaller, and you begin to see everything else around you. Right? If all you focus on is your hand, if all you see is this one hand that's in front of you, it is going to be the thing that controls and rules your life. But if you can just begin to pull it away, take the problems, whatever they may be, Because each person is going through their own stuff in life, going through their own sufferings, their own battles, their own way that the adversary is just trying to keep you down, keep you from experiencing the joy and the fullness of God. As long as he can do that, as long as he can keep your eyes fixed on one problem, one issue, you're going to be distracted and it's all you're going to see. But if you can begin to share those burdens with other people and recognize that you are not alone, your brothers around the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. And you begin to share that with one another. And you continue to journey with one another through life. That hand becomes smaller. And you begin to see it for what it clearly is. And no longer is it a problem. But it now becomes something that's useful. Right? My hand is over here, completely useless. My hand is over here, all of a sudden this thing that seemed like a problem and an issue begins to be used to work out the glory of God. It becomes a tool that God begins to use to strengthen the brothers and sisters around you. So you can resist Him. You can keep your eyes on Jesus. You can choose to take them off of what's going on in your life. You can cast those things onto Him And you can bring brothers and sisters into the world and know that you are not alone. You are not the only one who's going through what you are going on through. And so you can share that with people who you trust. And you can be open and the power of that is eliminated. And there's a great promise. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you whether that's in this life or the life to come as believers this is not all there is we have a much greater promise that these are momentary and Paul talks about and Paul went through some serious stuff like being beaten numerous times shipwrecked mocked stoned a whole bunch of things rejected by his own people He says, I don't even consider these momentary afflictions worth comparing to the eternity with Jesus. To what is to come. What are your eyes fixed on today? What is your hope in? Is your hope in you and your ability to overcome? Or is your hope in Jesus and what he's already done on the cross? Is your hope in this world and and it becoming perfect? Or is your hope in eternity so you can begin to enjoy this world better and begin to use those things that the adversary would want to use for evil that you would begin to be able to use them for good? Our hope is that God is actually going to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He's going to do it as individuals, but he's going to do it as a body. His body of Christ. The peoples that he most loves. You are going to be restored. In the midst of your suffering, it's not all there is. Even if it, I hope by God's grace, whatever it would be that you would go through, wouldn't last till the day you die. Even if it did, in the scheme of eternity, you have the promise that you will be strengthened and confirmed and restored in Christ. If you would just join me in prayer, um, I would really appreciate that.
Father, I thank you for all that you have done. You are so good. And uh, you are the main character of the story. I thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. I thank you that you have brought us into a place where we can know the God of glory. And that we can resist the enemy firm in our faith. A faith that you have put in us. And that as we fix our eyes on you, that we are able to walk through whatever it is that you will allow us to walk through. I ask God for those here today who would be going through incredibly painful and trying times, that they would know that they're not alone. That they have you and that they have brothers and sisters with them. I ask that you would strengthen them. Confirm in them what you have done. Establish them in their faith and in this community. And that you would continue to use the open door to be an example to the, just this town of Morris and surrounding communities of what it looks like to be brothers and sisters who walk with one another. Would you pour your spirit out upon this people? Would they shine brightly? And the things that the enemy would want to use to distract them, would you remove those distractions so that they would see you clearly, Jesus? And from that love for you, would it just pour forth to the people around them? And that people would begin to look at them and they would say, you are Christians by the way you love one another. Where is your hope coming from? Why is it that in the midst of your suffering, you don't curse God, you don't run away, you don't become bitter and angry, but you find hope and joy and strength? And that they would be able to be a testimony of Jesus. In your name, amen.